sitting with Justin Miles of Justin Miles, Miles Deep, Hydra Effects, and Milestone Entertainment. Thank you for taking the time and inviting us into your studio. You're a singer, a songwriter, producer, recording engineer, multi-instrumentalist, dancer, choreographer, videographer, director, and pilot. Did I miss anything? Um, I, I cook once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I could do some chefy stuff. Chefy stuff. I, yeah. I, I like try, it. I try to be Gordon Ramsay, but I'm not. Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> you can go so much better than Gordon Ramsay. Really? You can. I like Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> When did you know that you wanted to be all of these things? When did you know you wanted to be an artist, a dancer, a drummer, a singer? Um, that's a really good question. Let me think about that for a second. Um, no, I think it was, it, it's as simple as, um, I, I've always liked the way music sounded in, in person with people. Uh, I think the first time I heard uh, like a drum set, it was in like a garage a situation, like a friend, like my mom had a friend in College Park, that's where we used to live. And she was like, oh, we're gonna go and see Teresa. Uh, and I think her husband had a band and they just happened to be rehearsing in this garage. And it was the first time as a kid, I must've been like five or six years old, uh, that I heard like a drum set like 15 feet away from me. And then like the bass and the keyboard and the singer. And I was just like, it's just like hitting my chest. And I was like, man, this is, this is awesome. My little five-year-old self was like, this is sick. So it was just, the penetration of that, of the sound waves just like blew my mind. And then I was like, ever since then, I was obsessed with it. The drums is what, what caught drums, your attention. The drums, I think, would, yeah. And then I think therefore after, it was like a, like a first grade talent show. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, fun fact, it was Aaron Escalopio who was the drummer for, um, uh, what's the band, what's the, Benji and Joel, uh, oh, Good uh, Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have sure. known this idiot uh, but uh yeah so he we went to the same elementary school together and he did a talent show and they they ended the whole talent show and he was playing drums and i just remember being like how awesome that was to watch him play i didn't know him at the time but i was like man same situation live band and i was like man i really i really i, I just became so obsessed with it to the point where like santa claus bring he brought a, a drum set for me the the following christmas wow i wonder how that worked out so yeah that's how i knew and dancing was just always a part of the the equation I mean, I've, I've been dancing since I was three years old. Okay, so, so you started dance before you started with drums, music. Yeah, there was some kind of like seed that was planted with with dancing. So, but that's uh, that's how that's how that worked out. <laughs> what was your first music love? Like, you know, you go see your mom's friend's band play, and you're like, man, I want to. But what was your first? For me, it was the Police. Okay. So. Went and got the record, um, and was like, "Okay, this is this is it. I'm hooked." Like what? Like what song? Or just yeah, what that song? What band? What sound? You know, I've I've never been asked this question, and you're gonna probably laugh when you hear this answer. It, you know the 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 remake of "Lean on Me." Uh huh. Like the like the go go version. Yeah. Obsessed, super obsessed with it. It would come on the radio, and I would. It, it would see the point where it would come on the radio, and uh, my dad or my mom or whoever was driving me like, "Oh, it's Justin's song." And <laughs> they would crank it up, and I'd be in the back seat, "Lean on me." <laughs> just something about the way the drums sounded, the drums, yeah. And it was just, uh, and then I heard the the original version of it, and I was like, "This version stinks." I don't like this version so much. <laughs> the old school version, which is still good, yeah, dope, yeah. absolutely. Not knocking it, but that's that was the that was the song, man. That that was it, man. Jeez. <laughs> so the Christmas after. You mm. got a drum set. Sure. Slingerland. I wish I, w I wish I still had that thing. Yeah? Yeah, I'm sure it was a 1960s Slingerland that, like, me and my brother beat all to hell and just didn't treat it the way it should have been. Right. And to this day, I'm like, I think we sold it off and got, like, a CB700 for all the drummers that are listening right now. You're pro they're probably like, ooh. Um, it's a cheap drum set. It was, a, it was called a Sunlight. S-U-N-L-I-T-E. And I'm like, why didn't we keep the Slingerland? That's a, it was like, oh, it was either Slingerland or Rogers. Either way, it would have been worth like five grand today. Wow. And we just beat that thing into the ground like idiots, like little kids should, should do. Should do. <laughs> and so your first band? Uh, my first band was probably me and my brother sitting in the basement just, just messing about. <laughs> we didn't take it seriously. But no. If you could be like playing, but first band for real, for real, for real was, um, in high school, it was a band called Hayes. 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 H A Z E. Doing covers or doing original? All covers. All covers. Yeah, mostly like, classic rock. And at that time, it was 97, 98. So 
like fuel just dropped uh-huh. shimmer uh-huh. and we tried our best to play shimmer and I'm sh- I, I'm sure I have a recording of it that would would highly embarrass the shit out of me right now. <laughs> just dun, 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 just like not playing it anyway correctly to the original yeah, <laughs> to the but, original CD, but having a blast. I, 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 and that's what it that's yeah. what it is. That's what it's about, right? Just yeah. having a blast. And the way we got away with performing is like we would just do benefits all the time for Chopscon High School is where I went to school. Okay. So we would do benefits for like the chorus, or and then we would do another benefit for like the band. And like this is benefiting the Chopticon chorus choir or whatever. And that's how we got away with like playing and getting the gymnasium and like all the kids came out from high, from the school and that was fun. So <laughs> did you participate in any of like uh you know band in school or just your band? Did you do any uh yes, I was. I was in band uh my sophomore uh and and junior and senior year of of, wow. of high school. Um my 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 freshman year, I was in choir. Actually, I was in choir all four years. But then, uh, the band director at Chopicon, uh, Dr. Alan Freeman, uh, at the time, he was just like, he was like, I heard you play drums, and he's like, Why don't you come in tomorrow and during lunchtime and you know show me what you got? And I did, and so I became the drummer for the next season, and then did marching band after that. I was loud. He kept telling me how loud I was. I don't think anything's changed since then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, he was like, "You need to calm down a little bit." You're like, this the the p the p on the the p sign on the music means sh- like shush, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we're drummers don't. Yeah, no, they don't listen we to the p. Hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you started playing with Hydra FX almost a year ago. Yeah, it's tell a, me uh, what that's been like. We're creeping up on a year. Uh, it's been f- super fun. I mean, all those guys. I've been a huge fan of Hydra FX for probably twenty years now. So like have I. I've, I've, it, yeah, we all like. Who's who's not right? Um, and I, uh, I I would go and see Hydravex shows if I wasn't playing a gig that night. I would be like, oh yes, I got a Friday night off. I'm gonna go see Hydravex, and they were one of my favorite bands. Still one of my favorite bands, but they were at the time before I was in the band. They were one of my favorite bands to go see mm-hmm. live. Uh, and then I, I knew Greg, and I knew uh, even the guys that were in it beforehand. I knew all those guys, and then even now, Wally, Sean, and Greg. Of course, we were all friends for like the past 15 years. And then uh, I don't know the, the opportunity came, and I I thought about it, and I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it, you know, kind of taking it back to brass roots. It was funny because when when I first started talking to you, it was right before that that time, mm-hmm. and I was like, I want to do music with Justin. We should, and then you announced like, yeah, I just joined Hydra Effects, and I'm like, <laughs> well, not not happening now. <laughs> we can still do music. Yeah, but it was it was like. It was so cool because I had just started like talking to you okay. at that time. I remember and, that. Yeah, I remember that last year. The, and I think I was. Just, I was. Uh, it's funny because Hydrofex happened like um, like two months after I announced the Miles Deep. I was like, I, right. got, I got this cool name, Miles Deep, and then then this opportunity came, and I was like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but you can. I mean, that's the cool thing about like bands down here is like everybody plays with other people, and there's. It, it used to be like you were in a band and you were in a band and that was it, yeah, right? You're, you're, and you were not sharing. I'm not sharing my drummer or my guitarist with anybody. No, right? It, it was like sinful. Right? You did what? You filled in for somebody? But, you're but fired. now it's like it's so cool that the community that we have right now, everyone's playing with each other, man. Everybody's yeah. coming out and supporting. Like I remember last summer we went to see um, Three Days of Rain um, at Seabreeze, and the. Um, Somebody, I can't remember who, but somebody was like, hey, let's take a, a, a family photo with all the musicians. And half of the people there were musicians. And yeah. it was so cool to see everyone supporting, you know, each other. Um, so it's cool because, yeah, I remember we we would go see Hydra like, shit, 15, 15 years ago. When, um, and I can't even remember the name of that place now. It's been so many things over at... Um, in Solomon's Island, but is that anyway, sounds or like uh, uh, no, um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the place. But New Year's Eve, one New Year's Eve, we're getting down, and man, it was <laughs> just so much fun, so much fun to watch them. So I'm glad that you landed with them. Me too. They're yeah, you guys it. are a lot of fun. I love. I it. enjoy it a lot, quite a bit. Yeah, it's actually a little less stressful to play drums in a in a, in, a, in, a, in with them, especially with the, with these guys mm-hmm. or if anybody. Um, than do it like a solo gig. I love doing the solo gigs, but it's a lot less stress when you're, you know, you just kind of sit behind the kit and 
that's where I, that's kind of like where I was born anyways, to, to play behind the kit. It's your comfort zone. Absolutely. Although I do, I mean, we've seen Miles Deep and I thoroughly enjoy watching you singing and then taking your little break to do your tap dance <laughs> and then um, Josh, you know, trying to do tap dance behind you, yes. you know, <laughs> but the groove that you guys have, you know, the song selection and, and it's just, it's fantastic. I absolutely Thank enjoy you. it. Yeah. We do, ca- we do like, that's the one thing that we, we, we like in uh, playing with that lineup with Jerry, Jerry uh, Cowser on the drums and then Kevin Walker, uh, who's from Baltimore, is a good friend of mine that plays bass. He's probably one of the best bass players in the East Coast. He, <coughs> he, sound, rip, he rips. Absolutely. He rips. And fun fact, he toured with like Prince and he toured with like Patti LaBelle. No. And, yeah. Yes. 100%. And Justin Timberlake. And no he way. happens to be from Baltimore. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of heavy hitters that are from Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis Chambers, Kevin, Kevin Walker. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, Bernard Purdy, who's James Brown's drummer for mm-hmm. a long time, Steely Dan. So, so all, the, all the all these great drummers live around the East Coast, man. Yeah. Oh man, love the East, <laughs> man. You gotta love the East. So, how do you approach composing a song like "Your Love Is a Roller Coaster" when you're the one, <laughs> like you're pulling all the levers at the same time? How does an idea like that? Wow. Okay. Come together. How does that come together? That song is over 20 years old. Isn't that really? Crazy? Yeah. That's and a great it's, song, it started, by the way. It started, thank you very much. I appreciate that. My mom loves that song, too. She absolutely loves that song. I think I've watched that video, I don't know, a <laughs> hundred times. It's, the one it's, I did over COVID? The, mm-hmm. the, uh, the one with, it's showing you, you start with the, the, the joke with, about the glasses. Yes. How do you play, play the bass? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> She'll put a link in the bio. Um, I, I am going to put the link in the bio. <laughs> You're like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Um, so, so the song's over twenty years old. I wrote it back w- right before I went to college. And actually, the funny fun fact about that song is supposed to be it was supposed to be called a Christmas song. Okay. Yeah. And then come to find out, Dave Matthews has a song called Christmas Song. So I was like, well, that's not going to work. Um, so I don't know. It just it, I ended up like on like a I just ended up like laying down the the melody of, the, of that of that track, and on something called Acid Pro which is like a old school version of like garage band or mm-hmm. like whatever software, you know, guys like to use, musicians like to use. Um, you could loop that. So I looped that and then I put a drum beat behind it. And then I was like, man, this is really starting to come together. And I was like, this is fun. And I just wrote down the lyrics and all that stuff. That's how that came together. Um, Cause at that time you could just have a laptop. I mean, still to this day, but at that time for me, I was like, I can oh, do this off on the laptop. This is great. Um, and then over the pandemic, like almost 20 years later, mm-hmm. uh, I recorded that, the one, the video you're talking about. And I just, I don't know. I just, I had a tick. Everybody was doing these like videos. Like I'm, right. I'm, at, I'm stuck at home. I'm going to record this song. So I was like, well, me too. I'm going to do that too. So I jumped on the bandwagon. I picked that song. Uh, one, because I knew my mom really loved that song, but one, because I just love that song. Yeah. You know, it's just, you can, it's just got a groove. It's got it. a really nice groove. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad someone really likes it. I, I do. You catch a groove. And I, there's something I love doing is catching a, a damn groove, man. If I can get this going, uh, it's, right? it's a good day. Yeah. But more than that, it's like it's watching you like, OK, you know, he starts with the bass and then there he is on the drums and then he starts with the guitar and he's playing the piano. And oh, my God, he's doing his own backup vocals. You know, he's harmonizing mm. with himself. So to me, that was like that was the best part about about it. You know, yet. Yeah, there was the whole groove thing, and I was like, man, this is a really good song. But then just watching you attack every single instrument, like, it's nothing. I appreciate that. I do. I appreciate it. Um, I think after, like, 20 years of trying to do that stuff by yourself and being like, I recorded this album, this was a perfect opportunity. And, and I'm, this is going to sound selfish of me, but it, it isn't in a way. It's almost kind of, like, selfish to mm-hmm. be like, I'm going to do this. And it was almost like a proving ground, you know, be like, this is, watch this, world, or the 500 of, you, 500 of you that maybe have viewed it and the 30 of you that liked it. Um, but it was just like, it. I was like, ah, I can check this one off the list. You know what I mean? And it's therapeutic in a way, like seriously, you know, but right. it, it is very like selfish to, to, to be like, I did this, but I don't go around bragging about well, it. Well, I mean, I don't think it's selfish. I think it's, you know, to, to be proud of, of being able to pull that off by yourself, you mm. know, that's, that's fantastic. You 
tell me you're sorry for all the crazy things that you've done but your words mean nothing at all and i feel so completely numb situations get me tied up in knots and i wish i were day in day thoughts of past times i keep brewing up around in my head in love is like a roller coaster climbing to the top when it's time to take the ride i spiral to a drop on my senses gone the crap in this Nothing left in me. I sit around all day wondering how it had to be. It's too much to handle. So I'm coming down at once. Have to get this off my chest. Thought you were the one. Love has been so pussy lately. I can't, I can't seem to bear. Why does it have to be this way? Why is love so unfair, so unfair? Love is like a roller coaster climbing to the top. When it's time to take the ride, I spiral to a drop. All my senses gone, the crap in this. Nothing left in me. I sit around all day wondering how it had to be. Yeah, roller coaster. Roller coaster, keep all hands and arms inside the ride at all times. And enjoy your ride, yeah, yeah, enjoy the ride. Love is like a roller coaster climbing to the top. When it's time to take the ride, I spiral to a drop. All my senses going to crap, and there's nothing left in me. Now I sit around wondering how it happened to be. So I gave you all my comfort, even when you couldn't fly. The way it looks just bothered me to the point I want to sigh. So I think it's time for you to choose a different road. Why? The one you're going down is running too slow, too slow. The one you're going down is running too slow. It felt so good, I'ma sing it again. Love is like a roller coaster climbing to the top. When it's time to take the ride, I spiral to a drop. All my senses going to crap, and there's nothing left of me. I sit around wondering how it had to be. I gave you all my comfort, even when you couldn't fly. The way it looks is bothering me to the point I want to sigh. I think it's time that you choose a different row. One you're going down is running too slow. When did you start playing the guitar? Pause for the second. Um, I started playing uh, guitar probably when I was in the band Hayes. Uh -huh. um, I think I joined that band around 15 because I wasn't even able to drive at the time. But um, it was it was shortly after that. We would take breaks and then I would we would during band practice, I'd go grab the guitar and start playing it. Uh -huh. and that's I think around 16, 17 years old. And, and then did I bought it. Did, a, bought did it just come natural to you? Or? It kind of did. I would ask the guys like, hey, I'm, what is this? And they're like, oh, that's a G. And I'm like, well, it's this. And they're like, that's a C. And I'm like, well, it's this. <laughs> but they would have to like, you know, you know how yeah, you, yeah, you, yep, they yep. Put, put the position of your middle finger. Right. and Do the triangle. Yeah, do the, yeah. <laughs> keep it in the box. You know, learning like. I think the, one of the first songs I played was like Collective Soul, December. Right you know, on. Ding, 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 yep. ding, 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 And just stay there the whole time. And then your hand clamps up. That was the first, <laughs> probably one of the first times. 
then it just kind of like, I don't know, I became addicted to it. Yeah. I became addicted to it. So was there ever a time when you rather play the guitar than play the drums? All like the time. Be a guitarist than be a drummer. All the time. There was a, there was a, a lot of frustrating moments. So it was really nice when we had band practice and like one of the guys would be like, is it okay if I just leave my guitar here? And I'm like, yes, please leave your guitar here. <laughs> so yeah. they wouldn't be out the, the driveway and I would be like, just plug this in and I think this is how you turn the amp on. But I would play that and then you just, there's that moment. I'm sure you've gone through it because you're a musician too as well. So it's like any musician knows like you just get pissed off and you're like, I hate this. I hate it. <laughs> you don't throw it, but you want to. You're like, I don't want to do this anymore. This sucks. And my hands hurt. My, my hands hurt. Yeah, hurt. yeah, you get the little calluses yeah. and things. And and then and then I would be like, oh, and then the drum set would be like, why don't you come play me? And I'm like, all right, so I'll just go play that. And then I'm like trying to figure out a beat or something. And I'm like, this sucks. I can't blah, blah, throw the sticks down. and be like, the guitar's like, hey. So, and then shortly after that, it was the bass, you know, which I'm sure everyone picks up the bass at some point. But I was like, ooh, thump, 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 you know. So that's kind of, it, it was just, it's always like this triangular effect of just frustration. Yeah. And it's still, it is still to this day. <laughs> it still works to this day. I picked up the bass during COVID. I've okay. always wanted to play the bass. I'm a shitty drummer. You know, I just, I get back there and I do like a couple little songs, covers or whatever. And yeah, but like, can you keep a beat though? I, I can, but that's like, all that matters. but I want to be, you know, I, I want to be Stuart Copeland is what I want to be. Hell yeah, Stuart Copeland. <laughs> Love that guy. Big influence. Love that guy. What about the keys? Uh, so sl slowly along the lines, I would just start to dabble at the keys. My oh. mom taught me how to play like, this is how Your you play Louie Louie. Yeah, she could play like, so she play, she can play piano. I mean, you, she sit down, she'll play like, this land is your land, this land is land. Uh -huh. And then uh, hat, put on a happy face or something, and then Louie Louie. Uh-huh. Like, dun, dun, uh -huh. dun, dun, dun. Fun fact about that, when I learned it, I learned it wrong. I guess the third chord is supposed to be minor. Uh -huh. So I'd be like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I wish I had a keyboard right now to show you. It's super embarrassing. And it wasn't until um, this dude named Fast Eddie, Eddie Fuller, that lives in Southern Maryland. He plays in a band. Yeah. He would. He was like. He was like. Actually, son, you know that's how the way. You, that's how he talks. He was like, oh, the way you have to put put that third chord. You put, 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 put. I was like, oh shit. Okay, talk slower. So like he would do it. But anyways, so there's a fun fact about that. But I will record in the studio with keys. I, I'll get it on the fiftieth take, but uh -huh. not like oh yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I envy those like guys. Mike man. Damron. Mike Damron can. Uh, uh, uh. Josh Earhart can play. Ricky those. McNutt. Ricky McNutt. Yeah, all those guys. They're just like, oh yeah, let me play this R&B jazz. Yeah. Chord. And I'm just like, oh, you know, but. Come record with me. So, but I, I want to figure that out. See, that's me. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. That's so awesome. that that's a major seven. Okay, cool. What yeah. does that look like? And <laughs> let's keep playing that. I'm like, th mm -hmm. yeah. And then maybe cheat a little bit with the mouse and clean that note up a little bit. But <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is. Well, yeah. And and these days, I mean, you can do that. Studio magic. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you said Stuart Copeland, big influence. Yes, Let's huge. talk about that. Huh? Oh, he's dope. Yeah. So my one of my biggest influences with Carter was Carter Buford from Dave Matthews. Mm -hmm. band, big time. Like I would say the go all almost to, to the point where I, can, I need to stop quoting him a lot when I play. It's super hard <laughs> to not play like him. Well, he's a beast. He's such a beast. And he's yeah. such, but he was like the only, I think everybody goes to that one stage where they're just like, I'm just going to listen to this and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, you got to broaden your horizons a little bit. And then come to find out his biggest influence was Stuart was Stuart Copeland. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, now I hear all the little. Yep. I'm like, that's, and the huruta huruta, which is from Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich is another influence of Carter. So I'm like, oh, I'm seeing who he liked. So then you start to dig deeper and you're like, okay, Stuart Copeland. That's who this guy, because I love the police. Like you were like talking mm -hmm. about the police earlier. I was like, this is something about this drummer. There's something about the snap of the snare drum was just, uh, it was like addictive. Yeah. You know? And it sounded, in the 80s, it sounded way different than than all the other songs that mm -hmm. were on the radio with, like, you know, synthesizers and stuff. But then all of a sudden, like, here comes the police, and you're hearing this, like, snap of a snare drum, and you don't know who it is until later, you know, when right. you get older. So there's that. And Carter and had the same thing. His snare was just, like, you can say, that's Carter. <laughs> right. Just like, yeah, just like any other drummer out there. You're like, oh, that's, um, you know, I'm trying to think of somebody else. Um, I don't even know his name, but the drummer from Live had like a, a unique sound. Yeah. You know, they always say the snare drum is the voice of the drummer. Absolutely. So it's that's uh, why I like ska, because it's that like really uh, bangy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Here in your bedroom. <laughs> is that Goldfinger? I think so. 
I think it's gold. I think it might be Goldfinger. Yeah. We might have to research that. What yeah, but his drummer. that drummer. I mean, like you know, all those <laughs> rim shots that he's doing little, and that little magical fairy dust things I call them. <laughs> yeah, but it's that's what makes. I mean, to me, that's what you know. When I said I, I, I want to be Stuart Copeland, yeah, it's it's what he when he plays. You know, the symbol work that he does. Yeah, all those little splashes and. You know, to me, that's like, that's the exciting stuff, right? It's that Absolutely. color that he adds, yes, right? Yes, It's very colorful. I love that shit. Yeah. Who else? Uh, dr- drummer-wise? Mm-hmm. Oh, sh- 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 snaps. Snappy snap snaps. Um, there's some local drummers that I, 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 I love. Okay. That are a big influence. Uh, Rusty Williams is, I mean, you know, he's, he can get behind a drum kit. Don't let him, don't let him fool you. He can hold down a go-go pocket behind a kit and say he's not a drummer. Um, Chris Sample. Uh, is 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 a, one of the most amazing drummers around here. Okay. I would put him up there with like Aaron Spears, and like um, uh, what's another guy's name? Eric Moore, um, and then Jerry Kowser, the guy that plays with me. They're just all they all they got like gospel chops, man. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I want that. Teach me. Um, every drummer around here is pretty freaking uh, off the the wall. Um, in the out in national in international drummers are just great. Uh, Chad Sexton from Three Eleven is another big mm-hmm. influence. Um, he's got that snare sound. Yeah, he's he's yeah, he's, he's he's just. I think he marched. He marched. Oh. He marched. He, he I was didn't a, know he that. was a he was a march. I think he marched with uh, Blue Devils. Oh wow! Yeah, drum corps. So that's why he's got all this little mm-hmm. and they're just super freaking clean, and you hear every little ghost note. Um, uh, who's the other drummer? I was gonna say my brain's going faster than my mouth. So. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time, man. Yeah. You know, uh, Stevie Wonder is a badass drummer, too. A lot of people don't know that, but he played drums on, I think he played Superstition. That's him playing Superstition. I believe 100%. so, yes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't know that that's him. Bat, bat, da, 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 just that beat, man. It, man. That beat is just, I mean, like, as soon as it comes on, you're like, That's yeah. the song. That's the song. Yeah. yeah. And it th- that sound they got out of, out, of, out of those drum kits back then were, were like, it was innovative, you know? Yeah. That's why Motown was Motown because, you know, you listen to all the other stuff that came out around that same time, then all of a sudden this Motown sound came out of Detroit and I don't know if they, if I don't know if the drummers got together and said, we're going to crank our <laughs> snare drums up, you know, and just, God! Because other than that, it was just like flat and, you know right. what I mean? Probably, I don't know. I don't know what, what Gordon, Gordon, what was it? What's that guy's name? Gordon something, the guy that did, I should know this guy's name. This is what we need. We need him on the laptop being like, this is his name. Barry Gordon. <laughs> Barry Gordon. Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy. 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 That's it. Thanks, Jay. My dude. <laughs> Barry Gordy with the Motown sound, man. I can't think of any other drummers right now. I know. What about, well, as soon what about as we're guitar? Done, huh? What about guitar? Dave Matthews. Yeah? Yeah. I learned significantly from the same band, but um, he was a big influence because I just love the way... I finally found on the internet videos of, of, of like, of his left hand. I'm like, what, is, what the hell is his left hand doing? And then really studied and studied and studied and studied. He's and got a killer stretch. I mean. That little ninth yeah, stretch, that little yeah. satellite that he does. Uh-huh. Um, which influenced my writing a lot because not, not vocally, but just the way he, he wouldn't play full on G chords. He would like, play, he would half-ass it somehow, mm-hmm. which I'm not saying he's half-assing it. He would like, half the chord somehow and it would just sound a little it wouldn't sound busy is that if that makes sense absolutely um so a lot of the songs like roller like roller coaster has mm. that effect you know and um i really liked his style um uh emerson emerson hart from tonic is a big influence too uh he, a lot of a lot of people don't really know who he is but he's the lead singer of tonic and i love obsessed with anything that has to do with tonic all right yeah absolutely freaking lutely love them and I think they're one of the most underrated bands out there. You know, they came out with "If You Can Only See" and then maybe like "You Want It More" and um, a couple other things. But if you go listen to their B sides, man, I mean, it's that first album they came out with "Lemon Parade." To this day, is a freaking banger. Yeah, sometimes those B sides are like even better than than what they put on the radio. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you and you sit here and you wonder like, why did they pick that song and not <laughs> this, this one? one? Yeah, right. <laughs> why didn't you put this one out? <laughs> Yeah, because it's all calculated, right? Yeah. Pop culture, they yeah. want to put it out there, commercialized. Sure. You can't blame them. You gotta gotta pay the bill somehow, right? When I 
turn, turn around And I find someone It turns out now Just turns out is use me for what I've got I try, I try, I try so hard to make it all work out But then again, just turns out not so hot Two, three, four times I count it on my hand I think it's time to stick to this original plan The day is clear as the moon I find myself walking back from some place in that some way Can you feel me? I feel you Just talking about yourself and those little things you do And now you're dragging me out to dance A crooked smile and a little romance I think it's time, I think I'm gone I don't wanna take this chance just when I think it's growing up another fun day Turn around and it's another damn Sunday Excuse what I just said It all came out ah, Day is clear as the moon I find myself walking back from some place Some way Drag my head in the fumes Take a bite of this gloom on this Sunday Sunday tears away my heart it says walk with me Down the road I've had enough And I find myself in reality Of distrust on this gloomy Sunday Walking back from some place Gloomy Sunday Tears away my heart Says uh, walk with me Down the road I've had enough had enough and then I find myself Reality of distrust on this Gloomy, gloomy Sunday Gloomy Sunday Tears away my heart says Walk with me down the road I've had enough and then I find myself Reality of distrust and Gloomy Sunday What about in dance? Who are your influences? Uh, right off the bat, Fre uh, I, I watched Fred Astaire a lot mm -hmm. growing up. Uh, Gene Kelly, of course. Um, and that whole era. Uh, but uh, Gregory Hines was one of my biggest influences. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was watching like Fred Astaire and then I was watching like Gene Kelly and it was all like, you can't blame. It was all the old school stuff. Sure. Um. And the guys behind the scenes, come to find out later, the guys behind the scenes were like Gregory's boys, like mm -hmm. hit the guys that taught Gregory, Buster, Buster Brown, and I can go deep and deep into it, but um, they're the ones who taught those guys how to, how to dance. So then I, then I find out about Gregory Hines later, and I'm like, you know, great. it was like the, the movie Tap, it was the first uh -huh. movie I saw. And I was like, this this masculine dude was like, uh, uh, uh. sorry, I just kicked your microphone, Jay, sorry. <laughs> but uh, 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 uh. he was doing all this like loose stuff, and I was like, I was like, that's, that's, that's the it. shit. That's the shit. Like, it spoke to me more yeah. 
than the classical like ooh, sure. ooh, step out and dance with me, um, which I'm not joshing on, but it was just like my age, like well, it spoke that, to you. Like, it spoke more to you than totally, absolutely, totally. So I loved Gregory Hines, the movie Tap. Everyone should go see it. Um, 100% you should totally watch that movie. It's a badass movie. And then he was in White Nights uh -huh. with Brishnikov. So that was like, that whole dance scene they did was just dope. You know? Uh, and then uh, a show came out called Tap Dogs um, that my mom was like, you have to see this show. It's on VHS anyways. Uh, and then I watched that and it was like the same effect that Gregory had on me. It was like, just masculine dudes on stage. Not saying I like masculine dudes, but everything up to this moment was like top hat and canes sure. and like step out and like right. Broadway stuff. And I was like, eh, kind of cool. Pan to like the rock and roll side of me. I see this show called Tap Dogs. It was basically a rock and roll concert on, on tap shoes. Right on. Yeah, on a construction site. And I was like, this is the shit. I want to be in this show. And the guy uh, that wrote the show, Dean Perry, was also another big influence of mine. Guess who Dean Perry's influence was? Gregory Greg Hines. Hines. Crazy, Who, right? by the way, in uh, History of the World Part 3, mm. my favorite character. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Mary Hines. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back and watch that movie. Oh, again, my man. gosh. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> it's so totally inappropriate, but I love it. <laughs> it's good. So yeah. what's your favorite style of dance and, and why? I mean, I kind of guess, right? But tell me, tell me why. It's tap. Yeah. It's for sure a tap. It's the closest to my heart. It's the first thing I learned. Um, but when I went to college, and a lot of people don't know this, uh, I became obsessed with ballet. Wow. Big time. Nice. Yeah. Because I loved the the uh, the mechanical side of it. I loved mm -hmm. the, in, the initiative behind it and mm -hmm. of, of how it like disciplined it was. A lot of people think ballet is like, oh, two twos uh -uh. and ding, ding, ding. No, you really like, it, it, when I went to Point Park University, it was 40 hours a week of, of dance. Wow. And like... I, I kept playing music, but it was like, all right, I'm really going to focus on the dance part mm -hmm. of my, my career. And thank God I did. And I played music on the side too as well. But when I really started to appreciate the history of it and um, just the discipline of it, man, I, I was like, I was like, I was like, I went from like, ah, to like, let's go. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm smash this shit, you know? And it just, I don't know, I took pride on it. And I took pride of, of who I was in college, you know? It was, it was awesome. It was freaking awesome. Especially Ballet. in the early 2000s. Yeah. And the only like straight male dancer at one of the only straight male dancers at the squad, minus like maybe five other dudes. Yeah, it was fun. Awesome. Yeah. Call so me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so when did you know, when did you know that you could make it in, in, in the dance world? Like professionally, like no shit. I'm going to, I'm going to bear this it is all. My calling. And, this yeah. Is it. Um, I had a taste of it when I got out of high school. Uh -huh. I worked at um, Toby's Dinner Theater up in Columbia. Right on. And we did 42nd Street. So, wow. And it was that, if anybody doesn't know, 42nd Street is like one of the biggest tap shows that was on Broadway back in the day. Mm -hmm. So they did their rendition of 42nd Street. And I was like, this is fun. And that's when I went to Point Park. So at Point Park, they, they do shows throughout the year and bring in outside choreographers that might have, like Tommy Toon came in and did some stuff from Broadway and set a piece and all that stuff. So you get like little glimpses and tastes of it and stuff. Uh, that's when I did Tap Dogs. Uh -huh. I took a leave of absence. So I was like, whoa. And someone said, you're doing it. You're in a show right now that's actually, like I didn't know. I was like, oh, I'm in Tap Dogs. This is dope. But it didn't really hit me until like probably halfway through the contract. Wow. That like, oh, wait. Like this is, I signed the, I signed the contract. I'm getting paid to do one of my dream shows. Right. That I saw on VHS like four years ago or five years ago. And I was doing it. You're losing a lot of people with VHS, by the way. I know. VHS is like, look at that tape. I would give anything to have VHS right now in my house. That'd be I dope. actually have a VCR. Really? Yeah. Set it up not too long ago. Apparently, this generation is starting to turn the clock back. They're like, yep. they're like, let me get a, I'm going to get a vinyl. I'm going to get a cassette tape. Like, all this stuff. So, I think it's, I think it's rad. I think as, it's cool. As we should. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. So, how did you end up being cast and stomp? Uh, I auditioned. They had an open call in New York City at the Stomp Theater mm -hmm. in the East Village. Now, how long had Stomp been? They uh, they came out around the same time Tap Dogs did. It was around 96, 97. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole backstory to that, but I, I, we don't have to go into that. But they, they, uh, they're kind of rivals, but they're not. Okay. Um, 
So they had been out around 97. I think I want to say 97, 98. They were in the Orpheum Theater mm -hmm. because the HBO special just dropped. So that's what like pushed them into like, got to go see right. the show. Um, they had like two national tours going on in the Orpheum Theater. So 98, let's just say roughly 98. I should know this because I just went to the 29th you did. year closing. Um, but in 2005, they had an open call audition in New York City. And come to find out later, I didn't know then. It was a, it was a Monday morning mm -hmm. and, a, and a thousand people showed up. Holy to shit. Thing. Yeah. So then they said... <laughs> We the the line was wrapped around the block. Of course. And I was like, that that holy speaking of holy shit, mm -hmm. I was like, oh no, like they're never gonna see all these people, man. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like I, I felt defeated already. And then I was uh, I was just talking to some people, and then people just talking blah blah blah. And, uh, just I did it on a blind with no with no friends or anything. We get up to I swear to God, we get up to like close to where the theater is. I can see this Orpheum Stomp Theater sign, the neon sign. This guy comes out. His name's Scott. He's a casting director. And he goes, okay, this is how he talks. He goes, okay, we're going to cut the line right here. And I was like, oh, like, that's it. Like, they're done seeing Shit. people. And he's like, from here on back, he's like, put your name down in here. You're going to come back tomorrow. And we were like, oh, uh. shit. <laughs> I, for, I, like, you know, when like, you yeah. get that. Yeah. That, I was like, this is it, man. Like, every, it's just, it's a done deal. It's like, I felt, felt dumb. So anyways, come back the next day and then they, they, they do an open call and, Everyone's got their tap shoes and they got all this. Everyone, I, I can't even tell you, people showing up in like onesies and like just you name it, people showing up with like top hats and shit. Right. I'm like anything to be noticed. Anything to be noticed. Right. Like all pink. Uh -huh. And I, I'm like this. I'm like, I'm like flannel and whatever. And, and the guy, Scott, hey, um, if you got tap shoes, thanks, but this, we're not auditioning for tap dogs, literally said that. Oh, shit. And he's like, we're not auditioning for Disney. So all the extra shit needs to go away. He says, take your headshots, take your take your bios, whatever, get rid of them, throw them in the trash. He hands us all a, like a little um, like a index card. Uh -huh. And he says, write down, write down who you are, where you're from, and one thing that you think you can add to the show or like a like a secret talent you have. Sure. And I was like, oh shit. So I'm like, Justin, da da da. And I literally wrote, uh, I can um uh what is it called when you hang bole or whatever? Uh, I have I have experience um climbing is basically i basically uh -huh. said because i just got off a cruise ship where we had to harness in and yeah like, and i knew in the show that they did that uh -huh. so they were probably like oh this guy's not afraid to climb a wall okay and then they took polaroids of us so they never saw you dance no wow and that was the first thing they did they, they wanted polaroids of us they wanted to see like raw sure. this not like i'm i'm john doe and here's my right here's my here. feathers i spent all yeah. of them <laughs> <laughs> here's my onesie here's my top hat with a rabbit Literally, people were doing that shit. No shit. So then they taught us a part of the show. We, we they did a cut. I got asked back. They did another cut, and then it just went from a thousand people, literally down to um, it was down to twenty people, wow. and they workshopped us for four weeks. Wow. So they said, "You're you're ne you're in the next round, but now you're um, we're gonna workshop you," which I thought was freaking dope, man. Like, yeah, they're like, whatever you do, just treat it normally. Don't you know you're. No one's made it. No one's cut. So we came and they taught us different elements of the show and were really like, mm -hmm. um, the guy that taught me was uh, Patrick Lovejoy. That's his last name. I'll never forget this. And Stephanie Marshall. I still keep in touch with her. Right on. I love her to death. She was like my stomp sister slash mother and he was like stomp brother slash dad, if you will. Uh -huh. Anyways, but they were just our mentors. They taught us They taught us uh, hand drums. They taught us uh, blues. They taught us... Uh, Sticks, bro, bro, everything you name. And then they made the official cut. And it came down to literally six of us. Wow. And three of us, I think six or seven. And the three of, they sent everybody out on tour except for me. I you stayed, stayed, in, New York, in, New York I stayed in New York and, and um, cover, only because I had to cover for somebody. His back was messed up. Oh, my God. Which I thought to this day is like, I was blessed because I'm like, cool. I got to do the experience, the New York City life, doing Stomp. Mm -hmm. And then it was time to go out on tour. But... um. I, I swear to God, when they told me I got the damn show, same thing happened with Tap Dogs. But uh, when I when I when they said they, uh, Luke Cresswell, the guy that created Stomp, he is Stomp. Mm -hmm. Luke Cresswell, I still keep in touch with him too. Um, he was like, well, he's like, well, you know, don't get excited, mate. We just told you you got the fucking tour. I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm I'm excited. I'm just I'm just like I'm just kind of like I'm just don't know what to do right now. Like, That's okay. <laughs> he's like, why don't you go outside and do a backflip? I'm like, That's exactly what I'm gonna do. And he was like, All right, 
And then I ran, I literally ran up the aisle of Orpheum, opened the doors and screamed at the top oh of my, my fucking lungs. And on 8th Street and 2nd Avenue. Right on. Yeah, with Paul's Deli right across. The, and people, and it's New York City, so people don't, they don't look. Yeah, right. I was like, I was like, I was like yeah! Right. No, you, you could have been on fire and nobody looked at you. Right. Ooh, ooh, guys having a bad day or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, that was fun. How exciting, man. That was super fun. I yeah. can't even imagine what that, what that felt like. It that was feeling the, like the best feeling in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And then to do it there at the Orpheum. To do it there. Which come to find out, everyone kind of like switched, switched back and forth from tour to, to New York. You sure. know, like you would get so sick of you would get you would get burnt out from traveling. And right. the cool thing about the Snob family is they'd be like, All right, we're gonna stay in New York for like two weeks so you can just kind of have a stay put. Or do you want to go home? And every time I was like, I want to go to New York. <laughs> I'm just crash on my buddy Steve's couch and just uh Take the NW into to uh, to the to the East Village and do the show. I saw that you're currently finishing up recording with Ocean King. Yeah. What else can we expect expect to hear from Milestone Productions in the future? Um. There is um. There's a. a hopefully, I'll do something myself because mm -hmm. I'm like I'm, I'm recording everybody else, and I, I want to at least put a single out because that would be fun. Um. That's what everyone wants to hear anyways. They want to hear singles. Um, but maybe I can do a whole album there. Um, I think I think if I'm saying her name right, Tabby Spell, young mm -hmm. girl from uh, from Southern Maryland, she came and did two songs. And her that. goal is to do a whole EP. Um, so she actually came and recorded here. Ocean King, Tim Ramsey. Mm -hmm. he, he's finishing up his EP now. Um, What's that been like? Been great. We, we started probably October time frame and we did like one session a week and we haven't been able to do every single week because like god forbid he got sick or i got sick or right. i'm out of town or so we're, we're finally completed uh he's got five songs in the bag right now um i love producing and i it's, it's the whole like i'm your biggest cheerleader thing still yeah. um and i'm your biggest fan and when you're producing someone um it's not just sitting behind a desk and or sitting there and recording like you're 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 actually involved with them, you know. You're you're mano y mano. You're sitting down and um, you put your feelings on the shelf. You put their feelings on the shelf, mm -hmm. and then you're 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 trying to get the best out of them. And I feel like if people really trust and bestow their trust in somebody like a producer, in this case me, mm -hmm. my, I'm trying to make you feel comfortable, but I'm also trying to get the best performance out of you. You know what I mean? To get it on tape or to to get it onto the track. And then there's the whole like um, process of of like well maybe we can play that a little that intro a little less or maybe extend this you know sure. we're still doing that now we're like we just finished up a song the other day and I have yet to say this to him but I'm like well, you know, maybe let's let's extend this song a little bit longer because I'm just like you know you're sitting there you're listening in your Jeep in your car afterward you listen to the, the demos and you're like okay that could be longer you know it's and he Tim is great to work with mm -hmm. he he's like. He'll throw in his ideas, and the more we do it, the more he does stuff at home. And he comes back, and he's like, "Well, listen to this." I'm like, "That's amazing. That's great." It sucks when you have someone come in there like, "I don't know what we want to do," and you're like, oh, "Okay, come here, let's let's work with this." But he's every time he gets better and better and better at it. He's he's tremendously great. He's super talented, and he'll take he takes direction very well. Good. Yeah, and we laugh. You know, he's in the vocal booth, and I'm out there, and I'm like, yeah, we'll "Rush a little bit on that one." He's like, "I know," and then we have a little joke about you know, Speedy Gonzalez or something like that. And then like, you know, it's just like little stupid, you know, jokes like that. But I love producing. Tabby was great to work, uh, Tabby was great to work with. Mm -hmm. um, she came in with like, here's my ideas. She got a musician to come down from Pasadena and he laid down some guitars and stuff like that as a, as a demo. And then, okay. then she asked me if, would you, would you be willing to record this and that? And I'm like, cool. You know, it's like, what the best for you? She kind of played her own producer. Mm -hmm. I was more like, Kind of helping her, just kind of mold some stuff. So advising, advising yeah. more, yeah. But I was like, "What do you want? Do you need me to do this or that?" But it's fun. It's you know, it's um, and with the producing thing too, you you have to kind of invest a lot of yourself into it sure. as well. Sure. Yeah, especially if your name's going to be on it, like produced by. So, you know, you get to wear a big hat, but you're you're actually a part of the group. So if mm -hmm. you get a band that comes in, you kind of become like the sixth member. You know what I mean? Right. If they trust you, but you know, some guys they want to come in and just be like, "Nope, just hit record. Yep, make us sound good." And that's when you kind of go, Shh. okay, you know, and then you kind of say, well, no, you know, do you want to redo that part again? You know, no, no, Good. okay, you want it to be flat? All right, fine, <laughs> fine, right. auto tune. Like, why would you, why would you invest the time and money to come into a studio and not listen to somebody who, like, hey, maybe he knows a little bit of, of something about, you know, 
It, to each their own. Yeah, no, I to each their own. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And I, I, and like we've we talked about this before we started recording, but like you know, you know, you know, I, I don't brag. I don't. I'm, I'm saying, hey, if you want to listen, this is the stuff I've done in the past. But I'm not gonna be like, I can make you sound great. <laughs> I'm gonna put you Spotify, maybe. Maybe you know? if you said it like that, though. then they would come running. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should start doing it. Now you're going to have a milestone. You're going to see a milestone commercial. I'm like, hi, I'm Justin Miles. Come record in my studio. <laughs> we can shoot that right now, too, if you want. Great. In the guitar lounge. Let's go. No, nah, it's, 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 it's like, it's, um, it's warm hearted. Just to, I, I, built some, I built this not because for me, but I, I want people to come and feel relaxed. Right. And, you know, I know some of your crew was saying that too. They were like, "Yeah, this feels great. It's really relaxed and it's warm feeling." And it is. It's a beautiful yeah, studio. That's what I want. That's what I want. I want people to come and hang out and feel feel at home. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Not like we gotta, you know, we got twelve to three and let's do it. Like right, you know, right, right. Yeah. See, we gotta be by the book. You see. You know. And the bar is not too shabby either. Ah, built the bar. There's a bar behind all this stuff too. We have to come and hang out just to absolutely have some drinks. Next time we do the podcast, we'll do it on that side. Ex oh, we'll just be pouring drinks. <laughs> We'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the lightning round. Yes. We'll do the Over there. Round. We got to get a bartender, though, to serve us <laughs> drinks as we're doing the podcast. Right. <laughs> clinking oh, and that's going to be a mess. And... Okay, so let's plan that for like the year anniversary. We'll do like so down. full circle, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Put that uh, in your notes. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Vinny Kaluta or Carter Buford? Carter Buford. Sorry. Love Vinny. No, I knew Love it. Love Vinny. <laughs> I wish I could play like him. Yeah. He's got a he, crazy little style. I, I told you, he wrote one of my favorite drums, drum parts for um, for Sting's Seven Days. Yes. Yeah. I, I, it blows my mind every time I hear it. Vinny's tasteful. Um, yeah. I like his sounds, but his sounds are a little bit more towards that um, adult contemporary sound. Sure. You know what I mean? Where the snare is just like... Uh -huh. It's like, oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I had Carter all the way. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Dance or drums? Oh, oh, man. Oh, it's just lightning round. I'm supposed to just. Yeah. Drums. Fred or Ginger? <laughs> is this like kill Mary? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ginger, she was she was dope. I mean, there's there's a lot of other awesome female tap dancers out there, but. Um, at that time, I, I would say Ginger's awesome. I wish I could. She did everything that Fred did, but in, it's a quote. She yeah. did everything that Fred did, but in but high, high heels. heels. And on yep. the left side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the left side. Nirvana or Foo Fighters? Oh, man. God darn it. Ah! Nirvana or Foo Fighters? Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. <laughs> okay, so if it wasn't for... See, there's so many different ways to look at it. But if it wasn't for Nirvana, Foo Fighters wouldn't exist, so I'm going to go with Nirvana. Right. Nirvana. Yeah. Okay. They kind of, the, that grunge paved the way for so many bands. Yeah. But then we can take it back and say, this band paved all the things for Nirvana. Sure. But Foo Fighters, um, uh, their, their, their orchestration of all their music absolutely is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because um, I guess I'll talk about it, but the Hydra, Hydra effects, we're doing a, a tribute show or for the for the tribute show we're doing Foo Fighters and Nirvana correct and I already know all the Nirvana stuff because I just I listened mm -hmm. to it when I was a teenager but Foo Fighters I, I know it but when you really listen to what's going on right. especially with headphones on yeah. the, the, it sounds there's different. a reason why they have three or four guitars on stage mm -hmm. when they play live yeah and I mean Dave Grohl's is a nasty drummer of course Tyler Hawkins and then Taylor Hawkins sorry um, and then they have all the other guys in the band it just the stuff that they come up with is just insane it's insane it's not just a C chord. They're like the way they invert the C right. chord and in and in and bam bam in and like people don't realize they think it's uh, da, uh, da, 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 da. and it's like no, he's like hitting these like weird ninth chords that are just yeah. Yeah. No. That's that. Is that it for your lightning round? Yeah. My favorite color is <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite number is Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you so yeah. much for spending the time with us. And I really enjoy this. So let's do it again in one year. I would love to Behind do the this bar. one year. Behind the bar. Yes. Yeah. And we have to have a bartender. We have to hire a bartender. Absolutely. Yeah. Catch Justin with Hydra FX April 14th yes. at the Rex Theater. You're doing a Foo Fighter Nirvana tribute show. Tribute show. And it's not just going to be us playing music for 
a, a few hours. It's there's there's like it's a whole there's going to be media. There's going to be lights. I mean, it's going to be a, as close to a theatrical show as possible. Excellent. I can't wait. Yeah. Thank it's you so much, man. Ah, oh, you rock. Thanks for having me. Ah, oh, let's hug. Yeah. Hey. Let's hug it out. <laughs> <laughs>